Hi, everyone. Um, just, uh, yeah, real quick, as Jenna said, just interrupt me. Uh, the last time I think uh, we had some problems and people couldn't see the slides or, or whatnot, so, so please just stop me. Uh, very informal. Uh, so, and yeah, if there's anything you want me to go back, I, I really designed this uh, session so that we could try and really, you guys could get as much out of this as possible. Uh, okay, so I'm going to come into this. Um, <clears throat> So I'm, uh, I'll just start with introducing myself and where I work. So I'm the bioinformatics group leader uh, at the Genome Sciences Center. And I'm actually very fortunate this morning to be joined by my colleagues, uh, uh, who are the group leaders of engineering, sequencing, library core, bio assessment core, and uh, our projects team as well. Uh, because I, what my hope really uh, in this talk is that we're, we're able to answer questions for you, uh, for your experimental design. I, I think that um, NGS is really something, is a, is a powerful tool that can be used. And uh, I just really want to be engaging uh, with people and, and helping you think about your experiments uh, and hopefully show you a little bit about how the design of your experiment and the technology that you use really uh, is key to influencing what you get out of your study. So a little bit about the Genome Sciences Center. So here on this side, just uh, our, our, our instrument uh, fleet right now. Uh, so we have uh, mostly Illumina. So we have HiSeq X2500, NextSeq, MySeq. Uh, and then our capacity, uh, 1,500 libraries per month and more than 80 terabases per month. I feel like I need this slide all the time because, uh, as you can see on this side, you can't read this, but just essentially by month, our, our throughput in, in bases and terabases. And so, as you can see, we are continuing to scale uh, with the technology. Uh, and then down here, just to really a lot of numbers to say that there's a lot of compute here. So uh, we're very fortunate to be working in, in a facility like this. I have worked about 300 people at the Genome Sciences Center. And my team, the, the bioinformatics team, uh, we basically do all of the analysis of, of what comes off the sequencers. And so uh, at any one point, we're engaged in over uh, 50 ongoing projects. These can be small local collaborations uh, or, or large multi-year uh, ongoing projects. Uh, and we do. Uh, one of the things I love most about my job is that we are able to engage with our collaborators all the way from experimental design through to the data implementation. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's just, it's quite unique uh, what we do and I, I just feel really fortunate that we're able to have those interactions. Um, okay, so why is experimental design <laughs> important? I don't think that I really need to explain this a great deal, but I just have a, a, a quite simplistic analogy here to really drive that point home and, and explain the motivation uh, for this talk. And, and really, a lot of what I, I'm going to talk about comes out of a lot of interactions uh, that we have had with researchers, a lot of conversations, uh, lessons learned, um, and also, you know, things, yeah, just having been involved in a lot of different projects. So as a as a bioinformatician, uh, our analysis and our interpretation and what we're able to tell you about the sample is completely dependent on everything that happens before the data gets to me. Uh, and so in this silly example here, um, these are my cats, Farley and Dugan. Farley is the dark one, Dugan is the orange one, very important details that uh, I have to share with you here. And uh, this is actually a statistical anomaly here in this photo. I don't actually think they've ever shared after I took this photo. Uh, anyway, so if you think of my cats as the thing that we're trying to study, and if we were able to take this perfect photo, then, then everything would be great. But obviously, we're not there yet with the technology. And so all we can really do is take sort of incomplete pictures of this and then it's I'm given essentially a photo and asked to describe what is there. Uh, and so all I'm illustrating here is a couple different ways that um, my interpretation will be made challenging. So sample quality, like if you, if for whatever reason it's blurry, then there's a limited amount I can tell you. I can probably still make out that there's cats in here. I could probably tell you how many there are, even sort of the colors, but obviously a lot of the, the sharper detail will be missing. Um, 
And then the sequencing protocol or the library protocol also matters. So here, if you take a black and white photo, there's a limited amount I can tell you. I can still tell you that one cat is lighter than the other one, but I certainly won't be able to tell you that Dugan is orange. Um, and then, of course, often we're, we're, in fact, most of the time, we're not able to get the entire picture. So we're really just shining a spotlight on one area. And so obviously, if you wanted to be studying the orange cat, then here we've sampled the wrong area. So very simplistic examples, and, and certainly, I mean, you can do data interpret just like with photos, you can improve resolution uh, and you can sharpen things and you can use a lot of algorithms to, to improve your quality after the fact. It's always best to plan ahead and it's always best to at least know um, about the things that are definitely going to be impossible and the things that are, I'm going to have to be guessing at uh, based on the technology that you choose. Um, okay, so I'm going to, try and give a, an overview. It's, it's going to be a bit of a flying overview and it's by no means comprehensive, but I, I've chosen to focus on, on the protocols that we run the most here. So we do a lot of genome and transcriptome sequencing. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about each of the technologies and sort of the common uses. Like I said, nothing, um, nothing in here is sort of set in stone. Uh, there's always, we're always happy to work with you. We're always happy to try and make things work, but um, this is really just a general guide. Uh, and then I, I want to talk a little bit about the integrative approaches. I think it's sort of um, NGS really becomes powerful when you start to combine things and talk about a couple experiments that we've run here. And finally, just a, a very short section on, on other technologies uh, that are emerging. Okay, so we'll jump right into the genome sequencing. So um, just a quick outline of the things I'm going to cover. Um, so if you take this cartoon up at the top of the genome, uh, so you've got your intergenic regions and then your introns in blue here and then your exons in green, there are a lot of ways we can subsample the genome. And often when you're looking at this, um, it, it's a cost trade-off, right, between um, the bigger the area you're covering, the more expensive it will be to sequence deeply. Uh, and, and there are definitely, I love the genome, that's, that's uh, my background. Um, I, I always would love to sequence the genome, it, it gives you the most complete picture, but I, I definitely, there are times when the genome uh, can be overkill. Uh, so here are just a really br brief overview of the different technologies and the way they're subsampling the genome. So SNP arrays, I'll, I'll go into each of these in detail, but really just a, a, a picture to show you um, the different ways we can be sequencing different bits of the genome to tell us about the bigger picture. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is genotyping arrays. We don't actually do genotyping arrays here, but it's a topic near and dear to my heart because uh, this is the background that I come from. And of course, genotyping arrays were around a lot uh, far before uh, we had NGS uh, and short read sequencing. So what you do is you just, um, you take a number of probes. I think um, we're up to a couple million now uh, with, the, with the kits that are offered. Um, and you sample the genome at known locations. So these are common single nucleotide polymorphisms in the population. Uh, and then what you do is you just measure the, the intensity tells you what base, uh, what SNP, C or T, A or G, uh, your subject has there. This is a great way to study common variants in a huge number of cases, so you just, cases and control. So you can get back a couple thousand patients and then their genotype at X million locations. Um, obviously the limitations, we can't use this for actual variant calling, so unless you've, uh, unless the SNP is somewhere uh, that you've designed your probe for, then you're not going to get a genotype call and you really only get that one genotype call. Um, and then you can't be using this, obviously, to study structural variants. Uh, there are copy number um, chips that are used, and what they do is um, it's using the strength of the intensity at that probe to tell you how many copies, to, to estimate how many copies you have. I've worked with that before, um, and I will say that you do just, just get a lower resolution. It's hard to call small copy numbers. You need a large run of probes, and it's, it's a little noisy, so it's not ideal. Um, but it does work. Um, and obviously an example of a project of this uh, that using genotyping arrays uh, would be something like a GWAS. So you'd be looking for, you'd be looking at um, 
maybe a thousand cases that had early onset uh, cancer of a certain type and then uh, you'd want a thousand controls of normal population that didn't that were cancer free to a certain point in life uh, and then you would be looking for uh, you're looking for subtle differences with genotyping rates that's why you need the large numbers um, so you would be looking for SNPs and you'd be doing a, a test of difference to go maybe at this SNP I'm calling C's more um, than I am in the normal population and so maybe that's important uh, in uh, predisposition of, of cancer. Um, okay, so then uh, the next thing I want to talk about is exome and custom capture. So we do both here. Um, and in this case, what you, it is short read sequencing, but just instead of, of the whole genome, what you're doing is uh, in the case of exome capture, you're just pulling down the exons. So you're only getting the exons, uh, and then you're getting a shotgun sequencing, and then we align it back to the genome and you get you can get uh, obviously much higher depth uh, than for the same price as a 30x genome uh, and then we can also design uh, a custom capture so if you were only interested in a certain number of genes or um, if there were certain areas uh, are intronic or, or intergenic regions um, you could you'd have the flexibility in the case of a custom capture to be able to throw in areas like that uh, if you knew for sure that there were upstream areas um, that your hotspots um, that you were interested in. Um, so uh, you're using these usually for a study you're mostly interested in coding changes or, or if you know for sure uh, the parts of the genome that are important uh, for your study. Um, and then limitations, obviously, you can't call anything that's outside of the capture area. We do, you do get, uh, you do get off-bay coverage a little bit, but usually the coverage is really variable and you don't get confident calls and you should never really rely on that. Um, copy number is possible, uh, it's definitely possible for exome and with custom capture it would depend obviously on how big your area is. If you're only doing 10 genes then that would be really hard. Because of the discontinue, because of the discontinuous nature of, of the data, that it makes it hard it makes it harder to call um, copy number. They're just a little bit less clean. Structural same with structural variants. If your breakpoint does happen to fall in the middle of two exons or, or within the area of your capture, uh, it is doable, but again, quite noisy uh, and, and, and challenging to call. And so an example of project um, that we would be using exome capture would be, you know, if, if I was just interested in looking at recurrently mutated genes and I wanted to study a large number of samples. Um, or we've also done sort of validation experiments here where we had a number of discovery samples where we did whole genome sequencing, transcriptome sequencing of, of a smaller cohort and then picked 500 genes that were recurrently mutated there and then went really deep, designed a custom capture panel and then sequenced another few hundred cases um, just to really get a clear picture of um, the exact frequency that that gene was mutated in uh, for that study. And of course, clinical panels um, use a capture method as well. Um, okay, and then I want to talk real quick about Amplicon and Sanger sequencing. Uh, so this is, uh, these are the SeqVal experiments that our team here uh, runs. Um, so this is a specific use case for where you have a genomic event, uh, so an SV, an indel, SNV, uh, and you can design a primer that just spans that one event. Um, or you can sort of, um, you know where it starts and then you can sort of sequence across uh, to the other side of it. Um, this is useful for if you just need to determine the presence or absence of, of specific events. Um, so limitations, you can't really use this for discovery because you, you obviously you're designing your primer based on the event that you're trying to validate. And for a lot of the cases, you really do need uh, exact breakpoints. So a couple uses that recent projects that came to mind, um, we were trying to benchmark actually a structural variant tool and so we just wanted orthogonal verification of the borderline calls. So, so if it usually with um, Illumina sequencing, if, if it's a confident call, you know it's there and you don't really need to be verifying it, but when you want to go into looking at borderline, I'm not sure kind of calls, it's nice to, you really do need that orthogonal uh, validation to say yes, this is definitely a false positive, yes, definitely a false uh, negative. And then of course, in our personalized oncogenomics program, uh, we will sometimes, when we want to know whether a fusion we found in a metastatic sample was there in the primary sample, we've, we've gone back to try and do this. 
Uh, and okay, so then finally, uh, whole genome sequencing. So this is really uh, the best way if you want to fully characterize your genome. So uh, if you do uh, WGS, then you're able to call novel, you're able to identify novel genes that have been um, mutated. You can look for novel events. You can look for private events. Um, obviously, you can much more, uh, if you have a complex structural rearrangement, really you do need the whole genome to fully figure that out. There are other things you can look at. So you can sample the entire genomic landscape of a population and you look at mutation signatures. Um, this is something that um, is increasingly being done uh, in the context of cancer uh, sequencing. Uh, and really uh, the limitations are, of course, just that uh, it, it's getting cheaper, but it's still expensive to do whole genome. So you are limited in your sample size uh, and, and how deep you can go. And, and depth does matter. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in my next couple slides. Um, really what you want, I mean, if you have no a priori knowledge of your population sample and you really want to study it in depth, then uh, whole genome, like all the other uh, technologies that I just mentioned, you are wanting to come in, you are wanting to come in to test a hypothesis. So you already have something that you want to know, whether it's at variant level, gene level, whatever. Um, I know it's a common variant. I know it's a rare variant. I know I want to study this or that. When you have nothing and you just want to characterize, you know, a, a, a sample, then, then you really do need the whole genome because you're not sure what you're looking for, right? Um, okay, so just a table here. I'm not going to go through every single uh, uh, square in here. Uh, I wanted to have this up there for people uh, looking at the slides later. And so just a summary of what I said, what you're able to call, what you're not able to do with your various different ones. So all with lots and lots of caveats, of course. Uh, this is just a basic guide. Okay, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about population size and controls. Um, so I feel like if anyone has ever been to a talk with variant calling in it, they've seen this upside down triangle. It's almost always blue, I'm not sure why. Um, and that's because uh, when you call variants, you get on, a, so for a germline sample, you get on average 3 million germline variants per sample. And then if you do a tumor normal pair and you want to look at somatic variants, you get on average, depending on the cancer, this is very, it's completely variable with the cancer type, um, you get between 10 and 100,000. And usually what you're trying to do is get it down to like four, because those are going to be your functional important things. Those are things that you're going to write your paper on. Those are going to be your big findings, right? Um, and so you, we, we go through this series of filters. You do your raw calls. You do some quality filtering. And anybody who's done this kind of research is sort of often living in this space where I'm like, I cannot get myself down from 2,000 genes to just like three. Um, and that's sort of where your controls really, really matter. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the main, uh, so we talked, I mentioned GWAS earlier. So in this case, uh, what you want, obviously, large sample size, because you need to do multiple testing and corrections. So for a certain number, um, if you're sampling a million SNPs, you, you're going to need, um, you do these power calculations. There's, there's websites for that, just Google power calculations. Um, and so, uh, but the important thing is that you do need one-to-one -one cases and controls. So it's not really helpful to, you can't really identify subtle shifts in um, allele frequency of common variants unless you have a really large set of controls. Um, the other area where you might, uh, where the choice of control is really important is if you're looking for rare disease. So we do a lot of work here. We were part of the FORGE project, a couple different um, sequencing uh, projects for children who, who were born with rare disease. So you want to look for the causal variant or, or variants uh, that were causing this disease. You really need the parents. And you really need both parents because you want to obviously look at the Mendelian inheritance. Uh, if you want to look for things like uniparental disomy, those kinds of events, um, obviously you need both parents. And then if you're able to, sequencing of an unaffected uh, relative, so either a sibling, uncle, cousin, um, that also really helps filter out um, the passengers because you expect that they'll share some of the variants. Um, and if and if they if it's a if it's a highly penetrant, um, if it's a dominant uh, trait, then it, it makes it a lot easier to to filter that out. And finally, somatic variants. Um, 
I, I know that it's not always possible to have a mesh normal, but really this is, this is what takes you from 3 million private variants in your tumor to the 100,000. Um, and it, you just, you need the normal uh, to subtract out uh, what is different in the tumor. And you, you need the normal usually it's taken from peripheral blood. Um, it's definitely possible. I, we've definitely done variant calling on tumors without normal. It's, it's just very painful. So what you would do is you would filter out everything that was known in the population. And there's more and more databases that allow that. There's DBSNP, there's um, there's exact, there's all number of, of, of uh, data sets out there that you can use to filter it out, but it's it's still uh, people, every person still carries a large number of private mutations and really having having the blood normal is, is incredibly useful. Uh, okay, so then I want to talk uh, about two factors. There are a lot of factors that affect the, the quality of variant calls as I talked about earlier on. But uh, one thing I want to talk about, we talk about 30x genome a lot. So, so most of the time when we're recommending depth for a genome, we're trying to get you to a 30x deployed genome equivalent. Um, so uh, why 30x? So the rule of thumb when you're looking at variant calls is that it takes 3 to 10 high quality reads to call a variant. So I'm just showing an IGV here on this side. This is what I would call, if I'm looking, I'd be like, yes, this is a variant I believe. And that's because I have multiple reads in here and they're staggered across. Uh, and then here, I mean, there is a read that looks well aligned and there is, you know, it's obviously uh, one variant call here, but I just wouldn't believe this uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, it's, it's there are alignment artifacts or sequencing artifacts, and, and that's why we kind of require a certain number before we're willing to say uh, we have variant call. So, and then, but you do need to account for, so if I've got a 30x genome, doesn't mean I have 30x at every point in the genome. There's going to be places where I have 20. Um, Evenness of coverage, I mean, generally, you're looking, if it's 30x, you're like a deployed genome, then it's 15 and 15, but obviously there's going to be places where it's not even. And then, of course, uh, tumor content. So if you, if you want a 30x equivalent of your tumor, but you only have 50% tumor content, then that immediately puts you to a 60x. Uh, and it's same with aneuploid samples, uh, right? So if you want to, I'm saying it takes 3 to 10 high-quality reads to call a variant in um, a heterozygous, so in one copy. So you've got four copies, um, and I want to make sure I call, I'm able to call a variant even if it's just in one copy, then obviously then you're multiplying up again. So um, this is by no means canon, but uh, this is sort of generally the kind of depth we aim for. So diploid genome, you just want to call germline variants, 30x. Higher tumor content samples, probably get away with a 30 to 40x. Uh, lower tumor content samples, I'd be getting up to 40 to 60x. And then if you have a low tumor content or you're looking for subclonal events, so anything, obviously, if you think about it, um, you, if you want to call down to five, something that's present in 5% of your cells in your tumor, um, then you're going to, and you want 3 to 10 reads to call a variant, then you're looking at over 100x. Uh, okay. And then the second main uh, factor that affects the quality of the variant calls that we're able to produce uh, is the sample type. Um, so uh, I just wanted to touch on FFP versus fresh frozen. All of our protocols do, uh, so we do we can make whole genome RNA microRNA libraries from FFP, but uh, generally we do see, and this is across the board, right? Uh, in any with anybody who's doing this, um, you, you will see slightly lower yield, so maybe you need to plan for that. You slightly lower diversity uh, in your RNA and microRNA, uh, and a generally a higher false positive rate um, due to various reasons uh, for the SNP and SV detection. There's ways we can filter that, but again, just, just so we know, and then uh, copy number uh, tends to be a little bit noisier. Uh, so you can see the same sample fresh here, and then FFP, we had to do a lot of smoothing here, and that's why there's a lot less dots. So your resolution is going down. Okay, so that's whole genome, and I spent a whole lot of time on that. Um, I'm going to try and pick up the pace here a little bit so we have time for questions. Uh, do interrupt me uh, if you want to ask questions. Okay, um, so RNA sequencing. I uh, wanted to really quickly talk about, uh, we do two kinds of RNA sequencing here. So we do ribos ribosomal depletion and poly-A selection. 
main differences, as the name implies, uh, you, do, you don't get ribosome, you get very, very low ribosomal RNA uh, captured uh, for ribodepletion, uh, and you, you, get a, you do get a significantly higher ribosomal content in the poly A. Main difference, of course, is that if you are interested specifically in sequencing non-polyadenylated uh, transcripts, then you do want to be going with your uh, ribodepletion. Um, and then there are, there has been literature where uh, there are certainly transcripts that are important uh, that aren't polyadenylated. Um, uh, if your sample is lower uh, input, then again, uh, we would be running the ribosomal depletion protocol also for FFP, I think. Um, uh, and then just what we've noticed, there's a higher intergenic and intronic, intronic content uh, in our ribodepletion libraries. So it I, uh, doesn't matter for sort of general variant call expression, any of that. All my pipelines run on both. It, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, so if there isn't a consideration of that, then that, that's fine. Um, okay, so just real general things that we can do with RNA sequencing. Uh, obviously, uh, gene level, exon level, isor uh, isoform, and when I say isoform here, I mean all the known transcripts that are uh, in ensemble. So we can just normalize quantification. Um, we can look at quantifying the expression of events that are found in the genome, uh, if you have a matched genome. So you can look at uh, allelic expression, you can sometimes, interestingly, you'll get sort of subclonal events, but they're still managing to express super highly, and, and that sort of indicates um, functional effect there, trans, uh, post transcriptional modification maybe. Um, and then you can use it to detect novel transcripts or RNA edits. Both of these are much easier if you have a matched genome. There are ways of doing this, and there's published methods for doing this with just RNA sequencing alone, but it, it gets a little tricky. Uh, and then, of course, the, the common experiments that we're using RNA sequencing for is differential expression between groups. So. Um, Gene expression is, of course, sensitive to your cell condition, tissue type, tumor type, um, and you can, and I, there's a typo in here, to identify uh, expression markers that drive certain phenotypes. Uh, and you can also be doing correlation and clustering of samples um, to identify subgroups. So just uh, two examples here of just two differential expression experiments that we ran. So here I'm just looking at um, tumor versus normal. So I just had a set of tumors and matched normals, and I'm just using, uh, I'm just doing, a <clears throat> I'm calculating the full change. Um, and so these are the ones that are underexpressed here uh, in the tumor, and here these are the genes that are the top genes that are overexpressed in the tumor. And on this side, I'm just showing a volcano plot between actually primary and refractory uh, samples. They're uh, matched. Um, so I had the primary uh, sample, and then we sampled again at refractory um, AML, uh, and I'm just looking at the uh, log pole change. Uh, and then, um, so you're just seeing up here your uh, significantly differentially expressed genes. Uh, so the results are usually uh, much more difficult to interpret with a low sample size, so I would aim for 10. Uh, at least 10 of each, the more the better with this. Uh, it's really hard. I mean, you can do differential expression with two samples. You can just calculate fold change. But what happens is that gets dominated by really subtle effects um, because, it, yeah, it, you can just, it's, it's quite noisy. Um, okay, and then I just wanted to show here an example of uh, clustering. Um, so this is hierarchical clustering of uh, a large number of, I think it was about a thousand medulloblastoma samples that we did for the MAGIC project. So we took the high expressing genes and then you're just doing hierarchical clustering. Uh, and then these in this bottom row here are the, uh, the different clusters that we came up that, that the algorithm called. And then up here are your covariate tracks. So just wanted to highlight that, first of all, the most, the big, the, clust the main clustering is by subgroup. And this is well known in medulloblastoma. So um, the, the different types of medullo, uh, group three, group four, um, sonic, hedgehog, and wint, uh, they are almost like different diseases. So you can see that they definitely cluster out. And then uh, we also had a mixture of adult and pediatric tumors. And then here you can see that within um, the sonic uh, hedgehog group, you can just make out that here they are, uh, are more orange. Uh, the orange all kind of live together here, and a lot of the red lives together, um, showing that your uh, infant and your adults 
do split out within the group. So you can kind of hierarchically see um, preferably what is driving the, the grouping of your disease. So it, it's an interesting that you it's the subgroup first and then it's the age. Um, and then again, so really with um, clustering, it, this is most informative with a large sample size. And the other thing to really note, which is that you really do need very good uh, detailed covariates. So you want whatever it is you're studying, so clinical data, survival, everything. If the cleaner this up, what's up here is, the, the better you can interpret it because you can get all these clusters, but really it's not that useful unless you know what is driving the clusters and, and, and that's where you can move into your functional interpretation. Uh, so, I mean, you can, if, if I didn't know uh, exactly, if, if all these subgroups here, with if half of them were NA, then I wouldn't really know uh, that it's the subgroup that's driving this clustering. Um, okay, and then we get asked this a lot, how deep should I go with my RNA? So uh, I did this experiment, so this is a UHR control that we use, uh, and so what we just did was we started at um, 200 million reads and then we just downsampled uh, randomly, uh, and then I looked at how many genes are covered by uh, 100x, uh, 10x, and 1x here. What's interesting is that the diversity doesn't seem to really saturate. I mean, we haven't really gone deeper than this, but it just, um, you, there isn't really a strong inflection point. Um, and so I think that's really, that's, that's a saying that you can keep sequencing and you'll just keep getting the low expressors, right? So you just, there are a lot of low expressors as so we have a lot of genes. Um, and so then really it becomes a question of what you want to do. So another giant table here, uh, talked a little bit about, um, it, like I said, it really depends on what you want to do. So most, if you just want to do, if your main goal is doing expression, quantification, differential expression, that kind of thing, then most of the time you could probably get away with, with a pretty low coverage, bearing in mind, of course, that then what, what are you, what's happening here? I'm losing, I'm only getting 5,000 genes covered at 10x, right? And so if I do a differential expression, what we normally do is we only consider genes that are covered at 5x. So you're, there's going to be a, a large number of genes that you're just not going to be able to be including in your, in your differential expression. Um, and then there are certain things you can, that become much harder to do. So doing uh, structural variant calling using de novo assembly, I can't really do with, with low coverage uh, certain, it just bioinformatically it makes certain other things harder. Uh, okay. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about in the transcriptome section was microRNA sequencing. We do a lot of that here. Uh, we were very fortunate to be able to be part of the TCGA project and we sequenced uh, I think 11,000 microRNAs as part of that project so we got pretty good at it. Um, well, so I think microRNAs are now especially in part thanks to the data sets that are uh, available as part of TCGA are, are becoming increasingly studied. Uh, they, they're known to play parts, uh, important parts in, in disease uh, like tumor genesis, other diseases in terms of, um, and they do this by targeting genes and, and uh, affecting the gene expression. And so common use is obviously you're quantifying microRNA expression. You can do the same things you do with, my, uh, with RNA. Um, so you can do differential expression, you can do expression clustering, uh, you can correlate, we can do anti-correlation with gene expression to identify uh, which genes are being targeted by microRNA. On the left here, I'm just showing uh, NMF uh, clustering of uh, using microRNA expression, uh, and then I'm just showing a two-cluster solution here and a four-cluster solution here. Um, one of the things that um, we found with using uh, is that uh, microRNA is quite useful for determining uh, signature for, for prognosis, which is something that I think often uh, people want to do. Uh, and this is because microRNA um, tends to, we found that it tends to be a little bit more sensitive to subgroups. So it, it wants to split out. Groups really want to split out cleanly by microRNA. This is something we found through all the TCGA marker papers. Um, so, so there's something about the expression that makes them more sensitive to biological phenotype or phenomenon. The search space is smaller, so there's less microRNAs than there are genes. They're smaller, so obviously you can do more samples 
uh, for less money. Uh, and also there have been studies where microRNA, like a signature, has been, uh, has been uh, successfully translated in, into the clinical test. So if that's your goal and you have a good patient cohort and, and the idea is to look for a prognostic marker uh, to translate and you're choosing between microRNA and RNA, um, this might be a good thing to think about. Uh, and then again, same picture, uh, sequencing depth here. So this is a set of microRNAs that have been sequenced, and then this is the number of microRNAs sequenced covered at 10x, microRNAs covered at 1x, and then this is the, down at the bottom is the number of uh, reads aligned to microRNA. You do see here that um, there is actually quite a good saturation. So this is why we tend to recommend somewhere between 2 and 4 million reads. Uh, and then you can just see it's very clear when samples fail. Uh, so these, these, these two samples here I would be recommending uh, not to move forward with. Okay, talk real quick about batch effects. I, um, because this is definitely uh, a real thing, people, and then it's hard to fix later. So samples, I'm just showing on here. Uh, this is our microRNA 3.0 protocol, and then this is our newer microRNA 4.0 protocol. And you can see that far and away, um, the, the, the picture, the algorithm colors things by when they're different. So obviously this is a little, the, the red, the yellow uh, blue effect here is a little bit exaggerated. It's meant to illustrate the differences. It's median centric. Um, but you can obviously see that far and away the thing that's driving the clustering here is the protocol. So if, you're, if you want to combine sample sets across different protocols, and this often happens for many reasons, maybe you only have low input for some of your samples and so we have to use a different protocol because your input is lower, maybe you sequenced some five years ago and then now you have another data set and we've moved the technology on, right? So this does happen. Um, what you can do usually, it's best to combine them as a validation, so you would take your first set as your discovery and then you would look for the same effect, but you would be looking at the two data sets independently. You can conduct meta-analyses, um, and if it's really, really important then um, to, to really combine everything together for power or whatever, then um, there are tools out there that do batch effect correction. So what they do is they would just say, say I was trying to batch effect this here, I would just look aware, look at basically um, how the what what changes are um, what differences are driven by just the protocol differences and I would just correct along there to make sure that that's not dominating it anymore. Um, these algorithms will work best if you have technical replicates. So something to really consider is that if you know I don't know how you would know but if you knew you had to change uh, protocols. Uh, during your experiment to plan for technical replicates, so doing controls, sequencing the same samples uh, using one way as the other way, and then we can use that to train the batch effect correction. Uh, okay, some integrative approaches. Uh, I just wanted to highlight, I think, three sort of different experiments just to give a flavor of the different kinds of ways we can, like I said, I, I really think NGS becomes powerful um, when you're able to uh, combine different technologies and sort of to, to get a more complete picture. Okay, so the first one, most common thing is uh, when you sequence the genome and transcriptome. It really is, this, the sum is really greater than the parts here. Um, you, what you can, RNA-seq actually can provide orthogonal validation of genomic events, um, which is really important. Um, it really helps you improve your specificity and your sensitivity. Uh, so if you look for things that are only present uh, in, in both, usually you trim down your uh, false positives by a lot. Um, and then you can identify and you can confirm uh, things like alternative splicing. So you might have a splice site variant in your genome upstream of a gene. You can confirm whether that happened by looking in your gene. Um, and you can obviously then elucidate the effects of certain genomic events on transcription. So you can, you, you really, you're like generating hypotheses using your genome and then you're testing it right away using your RNA. Um, so what I'm showing here uh, is just, um, actually this is um, done by Kara, one of uh, my team members here. She's written this visualization. Um, and this is, what we're showing you here is that uh, here we actually called a, um, our structural variant analysis of the DNA and RNA called an alternative uh, splice, uh, splicing event here at M1, and then we plot here, just using the RNA gene expression, uh, using the, uh, just above where that breakpoint is, so this is the, the, the genomic 
breakpoint down here. Um, and you can see that the expression confirms an exon 9 skipping event. So it's just a really great way to, yeah, just a really good illustration of, of the fact that we discovered something by analyzing the G, we called an event, and then the expression was able to confirm that that was real. Um, this is another uh, interesting project that we uh, were involved in right now, um, where, and this is, uh, there's been papers published on, on a similar uh, experimental design, uh, where um, the investigators wanted to look at clonal evolution uh, in, in a mouse model. So they wanted to look at multiple time points, uh, multiple mouse models, uh, and we, obviously a whole genome was not going to be a good approach for sequencing, you know, and this is, I'm just showing a snapshot. Uh, obviously genome sequencing wasn't going to be a great, uh, it wasn't going to be financially very um, viable uh, to do this. And then, like I said, this would have been a time when uh, this would be an example of where it would be overkill if all you're doing is wanting to measure the shift, the, the shift of your clonal populations. So what they did was um, they had some budget to do whole genomes. So what we did was the tumor got put into multiple xenographs. And then we performed full genome uh, on, on the tumor, uh, the normal, and all of the mouse models. We identified SNPs that were common to both the tumor and the xenograph. So, and then uh, we also took uh, some number of genes that were known to be involved in this cancer type from the literature. And then we actually designed a custom panel. So we already, we, we limited the search space using this first stage of the experiment and to, to know that because we, you know that whatever clonal shift is going to happen is more likely going to be happening around these events in these genes. Uh, and then we design the custom panel and then you're able to then um, do multiple time points, do treatment tests, do multiple mouse models uh, and just use that custom panel. You're able to go a lot deeper. So with clonal evolution, it's it's pretty important to go really deep because you really want to be sensitive. You want to be sensitive to even subtle shifts in your allelic frequency, uh, and so uh, we were able to go much deeper uh, with this custom panel uh, and study the clonal evolution in that manner. Uh, and then the last. Uh, illustration here is actually part of the um, papillary renal cell carcinoma paper. Um, this is done, uh, this analysis on this slide is done by Rian, uh, one of my team members, and all I'm really saying here is uh, in the study we had done uh, whole genome, uh, we'd done copy number, we'd done copy number calls, mutation calls, uh, and methylation calls, and we could see that CDKN2A was recurrently um, altered in different ways, so either by silencing uh, or uh, copy number, so that was from the methylation or copy number loss or mutation. Uh, but we knew there were more cases uh, that we felt looked like they had CDKN2A function disrupted, but we couldn't explain it using these three, and so that's sort of what we were talking about. It was uh, sort of called the dark matter because we weren't sure what the mechanism uh, for the disruption along that axis was in, in these remaining samples. And so then we had the idea to look for microRNA. Uh, so look just for microRNAs. Here we're looking at CDKN2A expression, uh, and then here we're looking at uh, MERTEN. And so we just wanted to look for cases where CDK and 2A um, was up or down regulated uh, and, and then to show the targeting uh, by the microRNA, uh, by the Merten. And so all I'm showing here um, is that we were able to explain a large number of additional cases that had Merten uh, above a certain uh, level. Uh, and so just really to say that even in one mechanism, the disruption of CDKN2A function, you really did need all of these different technologies to fully understand all the different uh, mechanisms by which the function could be disrupted. And if you're not doing methylation or you're not doing copy number calls or, or whatnot and you're only looking at mutations, then you would be missing a, a large number of cases uh, that you could explain. Uh, the the mechanism here. Okay, I'm going to go really fast through the other technologies because a lot of these I actually don't really understand a lot about, uh, but I wanted to quickly touch on them. Uh, so microbial analysis, uh, so uh, 
you can do that a couple different ways. Uh, if you want to survey a large number of samples and just and you just want to look at bacteria and you want specifically quantification, if you want to study bacterial population, 16S sequencing is probably the best way to do that. We can also do, if you're doing a metagenomic sample, you want, uh, but you're interested in all microbes, so viral, uh, bacterial, fungal, um, you can just do shotgun sequencing. Uh, and you can actually do shallowly because um, microbial genomes are small, and we can run a rapid classification. If you are specifically looking at my, like either um, viral expression uh, in a tumor, in a human sample uh, infection, or you want to look at integration into your sample, so uh, then whole genome and transcriptome uh, are recommended. Um, and so here on this side, I'm just showing you the integration here of HPV into a cervical cancer case, and I'm illustrating the actual integration events here. So in order to do this kind of detailed analysis, then you do need much deeper sequencing. Um, OK, now I want to talk about de novo genome assembly. Uh, this is actually quite a large part of what we do. I mean, we, we mostly do cancer. But we do a lot of cancer sequencing, a lot of human sequencing. But we do, we are, of course, involved in, in quite a number and have been over the years of de novo genome assemblies. Um, so you usually do start uh, if, if, what, um, if you do just 30x equivalent uh, short read sequencing, that will be sufficient for us to do de novo assembly. So uh, using Abyss, which is developed here by the Bureau Lab, we're able to elongate your reads into context. And what can we use context for? So they can, if, if what you want is you've got a new strain of something, but there's a, existing references out there, good quality ones, and you just want to say, what's different about my strain? I can actually just use the context, align them, and, and call those variants. I can annotate to identify putative genes. I can do, we can do that just straight from the context. If the intention is it's a completely new species and you want to be extending to a full draft reference, then you do normally require a bit more help, so uh, probably deeper sequencing. And you do need something to extend the context from fully into a chromosome or a scaffold. Usually you want to anchor that on something. So if, if, if you don't have a very closely related species out there with a reference that you can anchor your context to, then you, you can, you know, you would probably need, uh, and you would consider uh, these methods, there's four, I've just listed four technologies here that I'm familiar with, um, and they all have different considerations. So you could do mate pair sequencing um, just to extend your assembly. Obviously, the 10x chromium um, gives you phase genomes, and you can also, uh, it helps uh, the power of your assembly because you know where the reads are coming from. And then, of course, uh, Oxford Nanopore and PacBio, which do the ultra-long reads, and um, you can take the slightly higher error rate in there because you're supplementing it then uh, with your short read sequencing. Um, OK, and then finally, uh, just a couple newer technologies that we're just getting into, single cell sequencing. So um, we're now able to do, or there are methods out there that can do whole genome and RNA sequencing uh, from individual cells, which allows for a single cell resolution of copy number and expression. So here I'm just showing every row here. Um, is a cell, and then red is gain, green is loss. Um, and then so you can really um, study the your cell population and how many cells have a certain gain, how many samples, how many cells have a loss. And here I'm just showing um, the, I'm mapping the, the size of the circle in here is the number of reads. And what we're doing is just we're resolving the indices and then mapping it back to the well location. Um, and this really just illustrates that you can treat your cell populations under different conditions, and then you can examine them as a group. Um, okay, and then epigenomics, uh, post-transcriptional modification is something that we definitely we can't look at through whole genome and RNA sequencing. Um, so really, for to study the epigenome, uh, which we know plays a huge uh, role, and then thanks to efforts like IHEC. Um, the International Human Epigenome Consortium, uh, where we now have all these comprehensive data sets that are able to help us interpret epigenomic data. So uh, we can look at ChIP-seq, we look at bisulfite sequencing. You can do that through methylation array, whole genome bisulfite, or you can also do a capture method, which is kind of similar to uh, exome or custom, except it's, it's for methylation. So this you can use this to identify genes and pathways that are epigenetically modified, or you can correlate chip data with expression and mutational data. You can cluster samples by DNA and methylation in the same way you can cluster them by microRNA and expression profiling. 
Uh, finally, immunogenics. Uh, definitely something that a lot of people in the field are increasingly um, getting asked about more. So uh, we do offer TCR-PCR sequencing here in HLA typing. And you can also actually do analysis from your just your genome and your transcriptome sequencing. You can analyze to uh, find out your TMB cell repertoire. You can do HLA typing. Uh, you can look at cell type abundance and neoantigen prediction uh, from RNA-seq data. Okay. Uh, I threw the slide on there because, again, this is definitely, uh, if I'm thinking about frequently asked questions, I do get how much disk do I need, so ballpark figures on here. Generally, you essentially, you want to be in the gigs or terabytes if you're going to be doing genomes, uh, and then variant files are, are more, you know, you can fit those on a desktop, but if you're going to be doing any significant number of genomes or uh, transcriptomes, then, then you want to be planning for your storage. Okay. Um, just want to open up to questions, I think. Um, move to my acknowledgement slide.